folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Come to you on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And what an honor it is to bring in a master musician, um, somebody who um, was defined, had defined his own sound on the acoustic double bass, uh, and then uh, remarkably was able to transition over to the electric bass and find his own sound, which is often much harder to discern who's on electric bass than on upright bass. And um, you know, he's an immigrant to this country, and uh, my third book, um, which will be The Cats, Volume 2, is going to be focused directly on immigrants' impact on American roots music, and um been waiting to talk to him for a long time. Richard Laird, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. You know, I, um, I know you, you, did you recognize that piece of music we let in with? I, okay, I just want to tell you that the, the, this is how spiritual it is. Uh, my daughters and I, I, there are many records we love, but there is not m- many more records that we love more than this one, which so, this is the epitome of, um, uh, of how great our country can be. Um, this, that was you um, <laughs> playing um, uh, with Lionel Hampton um, oh, yeah. doing yeah, yeah. the tunes of Saturday Night Fever. And right. it is so on fire. The entire album is on fire because of Knock, Laird, and Al Foster. And uh-huh. it, it's because of that, the, it's because of the jazz, it's because of the swing acumen. It's not, it's just burning, funky, cool music. And, it, and, and there's a very young John Schofield on. Do you remember that out, that session? Was it live session or do you remember that at all? I do, yes. Yes, it was a long time ago. Um... You know, I have—I don't think I've actually heard that album at all. That was the year I was born. Was 1978. That's when it came out. I gotta—I gotta send you this, man. It is the—it is so fuck. It is so funky. It's ridiculous. I, I um, but I did—I did want to ask you um, if you could talk about um, how you were able to develop your own sound. On the electric bass, it is it's similar to the Fender Rhodes. When the Fender Rhodes came in, a lot of people lost their identity. You could always tell within the first eight bars of anybody playing the acoustic piano who it was. When the electric piano came in, you lost that. So how did you go about finding your own voice on the electric bass? Uh, out of the I guess, you know, I was uh, going to school at Berkeley, in Boston, and uh, I guess in 1967, I was playing with uh, quite a few gigs in Boston, and it became clear that I needed to, to have a Fender bass. I just couldn't play it. You needed a Fender bass. It was that kind of funky mid-60s music, you know. So that's where it started, and then the first bass I got, I took the frets off. Hmm. I preferred that sound. There was no fretless faces around, so I just pulled the frets off and started using that in all my gigs instead of the upright. But uh, there was a lot of resistance. I mean, when I was playing gigs in Boston, when I was going to school, I played a lot of gigs at the Jazz Workshop, which is the main jazz uh, center in Boston. You know, I've got a gig with, say, Zoot Sims, right? Right not appropriate to play fender bass <laughs> definitely not appropriate right yeah yeah he wants to hear that you know hard burn behind him hard burn so but i mean is do you think there's validity i mean do you think that there is validity in that idea well when you picked up the upright bass um you know obviously you you know it could be uh, Slam Stewart or, you know, Milt Hinton or people that, I mean, who were the guys going to the acoustic bass that you loved and then ultimately, um, you know, 
how you found the, because acoustic jazz i mean obviously you what you're talking about is like you were at berkeley right during this time of this this merging of acoustic with electric instrumentation in jazz music which up to that point was basically an acoustic mu acoustic music so i mean how did you develop your individual sound on the upright well that's uh a much younger story. I was living in New Zealand. I was born in Dublin, right? But I moved to New Zealand when I was 16. And that's a whole long story, but that's what happened. So uh, I had a hobby of playing guitar. I was exposed to jazz in Dublin. My mother played a little piano. She introduced me to Errol Garner, uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, George Shearing, you know, that kind of music. So I was maybe 14 when I was listening to that. So when I moved to New Zealand, uh, I wasn't, I had no ambition to be a musician. I played the guitar as a hobby, you know, and I kind of uh, listened to jazz, you know, but I wasn't quite sure about what I was supposed to do. Anyway, I finished up in Auckland living with a bunch of guys in a rooming house, and they all played different instruments. And we would jam together, and I would play the bass lines on my guitar, right, because there was no bass player. And uh, after a short while, the guys said, why don't, you, why don't you get a bass, you know? <laughs> so there was a bass player in town, had an extra bass that I could afford, and uh, that's where it started. You know? And I liked it because, you know, playing the guitar, you have six strings to deal with. On the bass, you only have four, and you only play one at a time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, like, I, I'm trying to think, were you playing, would you consider those bands, because like you said, I mean, the magical part of your generation and even younger is just, there were no jazz schools. I mean, there was no, like, curriculums, uh, you know, outside of North Texas and Berkeley, and those weren't even around, I don't think, when you were in in New Zealand. And so would you consider yourself, like, did you play in skiffle bands? No, I didn't, actually. Well, here's, here's what really happened yeah. when I was living with those other guys, you know. I was about 18, I guess, and they were a little more advanced in their exposure. And what we had then was records. That's really all we had, LPs. We had LPs from America, right? So they introduced me to Miles, you know, which was a whole new world for me. And uh, groups like the Oscar Peterson Trio, Bill Evans, you know, all of that music. And so when I first heard Miles, you know, I was so struck by Paul Chambers, the bass player, playing with Miles, who did many records with him. I was just completely taken with the way he played behind Miles. I thought, wow, that is just totally cool, you know. And then, of course, I heard Ray Brown with Oscar, and he became my bass player as ever, maybe the best in that, in that genre, you know, of hard driving, very, very on top of the groove type of playing. Whereas Paul was a little more laid back on the hmm. groove. He wasn't as sort of on the edge of it so much, you know, which I liked too. And then, of course, came Scott LaFaro with Bill Evans. And that changed everything, you know, because the way he was playing behind Bill Evans was completely different than bass players had done before, you know. So those were, you know, I was 18, 19, 20 listening to those people. So they had a huge influence. You know, I just wanted to play like that. That was my, that's what I was trying well, to Well, I mean, you're, I, you're, you're Chambers, Brown, <clears throat> and LaFaro. Um, so Chambers, he, I just always get this confused. He, he, he was Miles' bass player in the late 50s, is that right? Uh, he was, in, no, from the mid-50s on. The first album that I heard him on with Miles was uh, Round Midnight. Mm-hmm. And then Ray Brown with Oscar, um, that was around the early 60s. I know, I mean, the, the, uh, the, it's really interesting, Rick. Maybe you can explain this to me um, because it's not, it's different, but not totally dissimilar from 
shows with Mahavishnu, but the first, I, I this, I never really took it seriously. I just did, wasn't hip to it, but I got an analog cassette of Bill Evans' Live at the Village Vanguard with um, Scotty and Paul Motion. And yeah. um, Rick, every time I listen to the, to, the sh to the show, it's different every time. I can't figure it out. And I guess it has to do with the conversation. I mean, it, the conversational component of LaFaro. I mean, he took chances. He was also using the bass to express as a melodic instrument. Is that right? I mean, that, that was, it was that completely unheard of at the time. And, and how did that? Um, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, there were other bass solos, solos before that that were quite melodic. I mean, uh, Red Mitchell was particularly Thank you. Yes. Melodic. Yes. You know. Uh, Ray Brown played it can play a pretty mean solo too. And uh, yeah, so but Scotty took it to a whole new level because he was playing uh, technically faster than most people. I mean, he just had this he developed this uh, sort of advanced technical skill on the bass that most people never got anything close to, you know. Uh, and he did that by lowering the action of the strings closer to the board so it didn't take so much pressure. And so he could use two fingers on his right hand to pluck the strings because most people use just one finger, you know. Wow. So he was able to double the speed by using two fingers. I mean, this is, that is, it's, I mean, because I was going to ask you about when you develop those calluses uh, on your fingers playing the upright. I mean, everybody says you need to, you need to bleed. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you the, you probably know about this already, but when I was in London, I came, you know, I eventually left Sydney. I was 21. And, uh, you know, I was busy in, in Australia, but I knew I, my goal was to go to, to America. You know, I didn't know how that was going to happen. but So I took off and went to England. This was uh, February 62. And after about a year, I started playing. Like, you know, I was busy right away because there was quite a few jazz venues in London at that time, including Ronnie Scott's, uh, probably the most popular jazz club in Europe at that time. So... Uh, Eventually, I got hired to play at Ronnie Scott's. Uh, this would be September uh, 64. And that was the most amazing gig you can imagine. <laughs> Wait, you were the house bass player there, is that right? The house bass On, player. I knew it. Uh, Joe Hen, I, I, I'm like, that's where you made... Go ahead, man. The floor is yours. Who, who, who walked in that door? <laughs> oh, it was amazing. So, I think first person we played with I think was Ben Webster and the, the gig was six nights a week uh, two sets on Monday Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday three sets on Friday and Saturday maybe very small tight place and uh, so the gig was each month a new American would come then after Ben Webster then it was uh, Freddie Hubbard for a month then Sonny Rollins came. Then uh, uh, Wes Montgomery, uh, Benita O'Day. I mean, just the list just goes on and on. I just want to. This is really important. Um, um, who? It was a working rhythm section. Uh, it was it was like Renee Thomas on piano? Who was who was the rhythm section besides you on bass? Okay, so basically it was. Uh, a deal with the British Musicians Union and the American Musicians Union Holy was God. the the artists had to be solo, and they had to use a British rhythm section. I love it. This is so great. Oh, my right. God. Yeah. So we were the trio behind Ronnie Scott. We were the piano, bass, and drums that played with Ronnie before all this started, right? So we were his rhythm section. So there was a guy named Stan Tracy on piano. Wow. Very well-known British guy. Uh, several different drummers. The best of who was a guy named Ronnie Stevenson. 
and another guy named Jackie Dugan. So they were the drummers, but the piano players stayed the same all the time. So that was the greatest school ever. Ever, I mean, ever. I mean, forget about Berkeley. We're talking <laughs> week with Sonny Rollins for a month, you know. For a month? You're, so he would... Oh, first of all, okay, so I just want you to also take me through this. This is really important. I, I never knew that you were on Alfie, but that's, oh, yeah. but that's, yeah, yeah. that was that where that connection was made when Sonny came and you guys got well, tight? That, that's what happened was, you know, he was hugely successful. The place was jam packed every night. And it was just amazing because he was at, you know, this is uh, 1965. He was, really at an amazing level of playing you know he'd just come out of two or three years of wood shedding and he was playing amazingly and uh very challenging to play with because he was totally spontaneous he, there was no music nothing written I no love rehearsal. oh my god <laughs> start playing you know on the street where you live you know in the key of e <laughs> it's like what <laughs> Piano players get me help. Help, right? I'm drowning. Where, where, where are where, where? This is this is so where the Jake Feinberg show. That takes such such for stick to itiveness. You're telling me that he was shedding for <clears throat> during this time when. Yeah, there was a period yeah. in the late '50s. I think it was the late '50s into early '60s that he retired for a couple of years. And uh, he was practicing on the, on the Manhattan Bridge because he lived in Brooklyn. So he'd walk over onto the bridge because he wanted to develop his sound playing outside. Right. So he did that, I think, for a couple of years. And then he did an album right after that called The Bridge. And that had Jim Hall on guitar, uh, Steve Swallow, and I forget it, uh, uh, Pete. Pete LaRocco. Pete LaRocco was the drummer. Right. right. Fabulous group. Wow. So that's how that story went. So. Uh, they, they didn't. Anyway, they did. They didn't record it on the bridge, right? I mean, they just called it the bridge because he was. At, yeah, he, he'd been right. Yeah. I that was, and that that was him after woodshedding, right? Wow. Wow. So you really get a sense, but that's the kind of state he was in when he came to Ronnie Scott's and. So the producer of Alfie's used to, was a regular at the club, right? The guy, the movie with Michael Caine. Sure. And so he heard Sonny and think, oh, I'd like to have that behind this movie, right? So he hired Sonny, and uh, so Sonny left, and then about five months later, I think October, he showed up, and uh, we were hired. It was Ronnie Scott that was a trombone player, trumpet player, guitar player, Stan Tracy on piano, and a British drummer named Phil Seaman, kind of legendary. And so we went out, <laughs> we went out to, I think it was one of those L Street studios outside of London. And it was uh, booked for five days, all day, not night, just during the day. Mm. Regular, you know, old-fashioned movie set, you know, where they have a huge screen in the, in the back. And... Uh, they project the movie onto the screen and they give you like a running uh, clock in seconds, like zero seconds to 67 seconds. We need something fast, you know, some fast music, you know, right. guy running down the street. Oh, this is great. Oh, my God. This is great, yeah. That's how they did it then. So Sonny arrives and we're all there waiting, you know, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., arrive sharp, you know, ready to go, upright bass, of course. And Sonny arrives, you know, doesn't say anything, because he's, he's a sort of a strange person, as he was then, you know. He was unusual in every way. You know. Absolutely. And so he went over, took his coat off, unpacked his saxophone, and so we're noticing he's not carrying any music with him. He doesn't have a briefcase or anything. We're expecting to see like a score with some charts and that sort of thing. You know, some kind of uh, plan, I guess. So 
so Ronnie goes up and says, uh, Sonny, uh, I, no- I notice you don't have any music. Uh, how, are we, how are we to approach this project? And Sonny just looks at him and says, lightly, Ronnie, very lightly. <laughs> I mean, I, I I just miss these. Um, I don't know. They're just they're almost Zen mastery kind of things. You know, they, they say three words, and you're like, "What is he talking about?" But it takes you out of your original mindset, and then you're, then you're just. I mean, and also the truth is that he knew in his mind that, or maybe he didn't, but that somebody was going to say. Here you, you got a minute, seven seconds. We need some fast tempo stuff, and you guys could just riff off a theme and knock it out, you know. But it was uh, that's kind of what happened, except that he did actually have a plan. He did, and it was so incredibly creative that it wasn't written down. He had it in his head. He thought about it. There's a movie, a very famous movie from the 50s called An American in Paris. You know that movie? Yeah, I do, yeah. Well, there's a theme, that beautiful theme that was playing behind uh, Gene Kelly when he was dancing in the rain. Remember that song? Yes. Singing in the rain, dancing in the rain, wherever it is. Uh, Well, there's there's an introduction to that song that goes, Right, that's that's the way the dance sequence starts. Sonny took that little melody, and if you listen to the music from Alfie, that was Alfie's theme. But he turned it into a minor blues. He had a plan the whole time. Right, so that's what he that's what we did, and then Stan, the piano player, was a pretty good arranger. So he had a bunch of music charts with him. So he quickly scratched out uh, the chord changes, parts for trombone, trumpet, and and Ronnie, the other saxophone player. And that was it. That's that's where we went. That that became the team for the movie, Alfie's team. That's how it happened. There was no plan. It just he had this sketchy little idea, but it was quite clever because you know he was using. Uh, the idea of an American in London, not an American in Paris. When you were in uh, uh, Sydney, um, did you, one guy, I mean, I've I've done so many interviews on my program, but one guy that had a chance to talk to is Bryce Rohde. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you, with Jack Brokenshaw, like, did you, did you swing, did you, did you play with those cats when you lived there? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They were my early teachers, those guys. That's uh, so beautiful, yeah. man. What, like, tell me about what, if, if anything, uh, maybe more mentally or, I don't know, spiritually more than anything, what, what, did, what, were they, what, what did they teach you that, that you hung on to throughout your career? Oh, well, first of all, I encountered, when I first in King's Cross, which is kind of the Times Square of Sydney, right? And, uh, the the, uh, the Bryce Rohde Quartet was playing there, you know, once every Tuesday, I think. And uh, everybody just packed in to hear them. They were the best players in town. They were the, the heavy players, right? So I was in total awe when I first heard that. It was like, this is my first experience of real, live, in-person jazz. Because up to that point, it had all be on records. You know? Right. And there they were, in person. I got very tight with the bass player. His name was Ed Gaston, an American expatriate living there. Wonderful bass player and an amazing English drummer named Colin Bailey, who's been living in America for years. Oh, dude, I, I just was at Colin's house up in um, in Oxnard uh, about half a year ago, man, and we did a Facebook Live. What a beautiful dude, man. I love that cat. So he was, he was like a young dude, then. he was probably... 20 something back and so he was the drummer in the Bryce Rohde Quartet so they all became my heroes like oh I, I want to be what those guys are you know you know when you're 20 years old you're very impressed with these things absolutely I mean uh, talking to R- uh, Richard Laird here on the Jake Feinberg show you know, we, have a, we have a game on this program called 
name that voice. I'm going to put this put this in for you, and I want you to take a listen to it, and then we'll come back and break it down. Okay. I don't, I don't see how I can either. Absolutely. And this, this is, look, we're, we're living in an age where music is not, this doesn't have the same role in society as it did back then. It really wasn't. Look, it was a matter of life and death, even to some of the listeners. Literally. It really meant something to the people back then. And cats would get very partisan about it. Man, you know, like you had to, you had to give your all. You know, I mean, it was it was quite an experience for me. I used to play a lot in Harlem at the at the was it uh, the famous place? The Smalls Paradise. God. Smalls. Not Smalls, but uh, I maybe it was called Smalls at some point. But uh, the famous place. Well, yeah, I just can't think of the name right now. It's, it's all right. It'll come. come. Yeah. <laughs> The, the real famous place, uh, not Smalls, oh God, my brain. It was a Club Harlem? Or the Apollo, the Apollo? No, no where, uh, where all the bebop stuff really happened. The, the oh, Bird, oh, Birdland. No, no, not Birdland, no, this is in Harlem, I'm talking about Yeah, no, I mean, dude, I'm totally stumped, dude, I've given you everything I got. Oh, uh, well, maybe it was, uh, well, I don't remember. All I know is that, like, I mean, like, like, uh, I mean. Mintons. You know, Mintons. Mintons. Mint, Mint, Mintons was the Bebops? Was Mintons. That, uh, wow, okay, cool. This is, this is like when Mark and all those cats, I mean, this, I used to play this, you know, it was because I was <laughs> part of that, I was lucky for some reason, well, not for the reason being, I was accepted because I wasn't a, an American, you know? And the, and the cats, I was just part of that scene. I was lucky, you know. I mean, I know I was working with Stanley Tarantino at the beginning, you know. Like, I've done a lot of that stuff, you know. So, and I was traveling with Yusef, you know. It was, so I kind of got, I really felt I was in a very special position in the sense that I really kind of, here I am, this white boy playing the blues. Really steeped in the blues. Well, Mr. Laird, do you have any idea who that is? Uh, no question about it, Mike Knock. That is correct. The beautiful Mike Knock. That was my interview with him from June twenty third, twenty seventeen. So, um, well, we I have a lot of history together. Why don't you? Why don't you break down? I mean, to me, the, the, you guys are two of the most beautiful players I've ever heard. Mike um, told me. I mean, this whole interview is such a riot because like a lot of these beautiful masters of improvisation, he has no idea what's coming out of him. And then someone like Hal Galper will come up to him at a seminar and be like, how did you do that again? How, how did you do that? And he, he'll say, Michael say, I have no idea how I did it. And it'll drive Hal crazy, you know, cause he'll think he's not telling the truth, but the, the, you just listen to what he was playing and it was, he knew he was a conduit for the music from the heavens. And, and I feel that in some ways you were doing the same thing. So, Talk a little bit about your musical and personal relationship. Oh, well, uh, and uh, we were staying at a rooming house in, uh, in the, just, you know, outside of the center of town in Auckland. And there was a little extra a garage that had to be converted into a, a living studio. And guess who was living there? Mike Knox. Hmm. Uh, I think he's about a year and a half older than I am. So I was... 16, so he would have been 17 and a half, 18. There was an upright piano in there, and uh, he was practicing Hannon, you know, piano book. And so that's how we met. And, you know, he was already on the path. I hadn't even thought about being a musician at that point. And, you know, he just went forward, and then eventually he, uh, he moved to, New Ze- uh, to Sydney long before I did and established himself quite well in the Sydney scene. He had a very well-known trio there when I went there uh, called the Three Out Trio. It was the name of it. They did an album, and they toured, you know, as a trio. So but we, we got to play a lot. Uh, in fact, we lived, we lived in the same funky uh, rooming house in a, in a district of Sydney where the... Uh, prostitutes were it was almost like Montmartre in Paris in the <laughs> yes 
<laughs> just, it just, it, it was, or 52nd Street in New York at one time. Yeah, it was very funky, and uh, it was not far from King's Cross, which I said was the, you know, the kind of Times Square of Sydney where all the nightlife was. We could walk there, you know, I could carry my bass there. You know. Funky little house, so he, he was downstairs, and he had his piano, and I was upstairs with my upright. So, you know, we listened to a lot of music together, you know, uh, and moved, you know, he moved to England before I did, and then by the time I got to England, he, he'd already moved to America. So we kind of followed paths, and then uh, let's see what happened. After Mahavishnu, I was in New York freelancing and playing a lot with uh, Eddie Daniels, this fabulous uh, woodwind player. Sure, yeah. And uh, Mike was in the group with uh, very, various, lots of different drummers, but Mike and I were, did lots of gigs with Eddie. And, uh, yeah, so we had a lot of history together. Um, like, you, can you talk a little bit about, um, in your mind, uh, what rhythm sections can do to increase the vocabulary in music? And what I mean by that is... Um, uh, Stanley Clark told me that in some ways those the rhythm sections are the gatekeepers to new musical vocabulary Ron Carter said that they can set the table or they can create the conditions for it um, you know but as far as expansion of vocabulary um, in music I mean I look at it and for a variety of reasons I just I don't hear a lot of new vocabulary, and I haven't for a long time, but when you were coming up, it was like just growing, instrumental music especially, was just growing leaps and bounds. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the fourth way that Mike Knock was in with Eddie Marshall, that predated Weather Report. Um, right. I mean, this was like a bastion of new music, and I wanted to know what you think in general a rhythm section's role is in creating new musical vocabulary. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting question because, you know, the last, say, 15, 20 years, things have moved so fast in the, just the technology and the way music is created, you know, the, the advent of synthesizers and the way they're used to produce music has expanded so rapidly, you know. Um, it's in some ways, there's so much automation now, you know, you can create interesting grooves just by pressing buttons, you know. There's no musician there at all, but you're creating very interesting rhythmic stuff. Uh, I mean, I think it's all valid, you know. I think we have to use the two... You know, you might want to, <clears throat> uh, you might prefer to continue the legacy of traditional rhythm sections and just expand it as best you can in that format, or leave that behind completely and go somewhere else and start incorporating all kinds of ethnic rhythms, Indian rhythms, Arabic rhythms, different uh, harmonic uh styles, you know, that are also international, you know, it's, it's all available now because the information is all available, you know, it's not a mystery anymore. I want to read you this quote from, from Ron Carter from an interview I did with him um, in Mesa, Arizona, a couple of years ago. He said, rhythm sections in and of them." in and of themselves do not increase musical vocabulary, but they certainly assist in that process. Were the backdrop of the soloists, which is piano, bass, and drums, and in this case, it was with Kenny Barron and Billy Cobham, our input and impact on their solos are a major force in whatever direction they choose to take their solo. We're not individually responsible for them playing different necessarily. 
as a group of three in this case, our individual concepts of how to play a rhythm, how to play changes, how to be a presence in the construct of the solo, in mounting the form, in maintaining whatever musical intent the band has, we share in that responsibility depending on the horn player's responsibility to trust our judgment, to trust our direction in the music. Hopefully we'll help them play notes that they practice at home. I call it their kitchen solos. And, you know, I mean, did, looking back, do, do you, how did you, I mean, just looking at like uh, Mahavishnu as an example, I mean, that basically started as um, uh, uh, guitar and drums for a long time. And, and I'm wondering um, if it was essentially unspoken between the band um, about how you were going to, well, just in general, I mean, it, it always seems that like what you guys did at that time, that original in, incarnation of the band um, is remarkable because you guys are all operating on that same spiritual frequency and you're making it look somewhat effortless and yet you're playing incredibly complex music that had not really been fused together before and I'm just wondering if you recognized in that time what your role was not just as a role as a bass player but a role in your role as evolving this music Well, it was uh, it was a pretty big adjustment for me, and I think probably for all of us. But I hadn't encountered uh, that type of intensity before because you know the, the gigs I was doing on upright were very you know straight ahead jazz stuff, and uh, and of course the stuff I was doing with Mike and John Abercrombie in New York was very. You know, we had our own thing, but it was still traditionally based, you know. But then, you you know, we started rehearsing with John in New York in uh, June 71 in a loft in downtown Manhattan. And, you know, we had, I think we rehearsed probably three, four days a week from the morning to the afternoon. And I'd never encountered anything that loud before. It was a complete mind blower for me. Really? This is how loud it is? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, man. I mean, the, um, first of all, I just want to go back here. Uh, Abercrombie got a gig with Johnny Hammond Smith, when, and that was his first gig in New York. When, when You and Mike Knock and Abercrombie had a trio together? Oh yeah, yeah, we had a fabulous trio. Yeah. A guitar, it was guitar. No, it was a it was a drummerless trio. Drummerless trio. Oh yeah. my god! Can you talk? That is in, that is the most insane, because that's my favorite Oscar Peterson record, with Ray Brown and Herb Ellis and Stan Getz. And there's no drummer. Thought, no drummer. That's, a, that's an amazing album. <laughs> I can't believe you guys had a drummerless trio, man. Yeah, for quite a while, we used to play at a club called yeah that was that was really nice well i'm sorry what was what was the club's name a sweet basil a sweet basil basil. i think it's still there yeah so that was because you know you know i guess maybe the so the, the 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 sonic nature of the music was loud it was loud and it was and rhythmically very challenging i never really dug into you know Nine eight or five four or nineteen eight, you know all the different time signatures we played, and you know it, it took me quite a while to figure out how to get unconscious with it, you know, so I didn't have to count anymore. I just feel it, you know, just feel it, and that's where it went. But you know, I thought my role was basically very different than say Stanley Clark's perspective in Chick's band, you know, or in his other work. I felt like there was so much going on between John, Jan, and Jerry, right, harmonically and melodically, that I needed to play as little as possible. 
That's what I felt my role was. I was like, don't try to play that fast. First of all, I can't play that fast anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm not, I was never like a, a, a brilliant fender based technician like Jocko or Stanley, you know. It just wasn't my thing. I didn't really want to do that, you know. So I figured just play rhythmically as accurately as possible because there's so much going on between those guys and Billy. Someone had to say one. You know, you know what I mean? Dude, I mean, you're now, the John B. Williams in, in Horace Silver's band, this predate with Billy, this predated Mahavishnu. He said, you know, if they left the head of the tune with Manny Maupin and Randy Brecker, he, he, he used the term, somebody had to stay home and man the store. You know, some... <laughs> Someone had to stay home and lock it in, you know, and just hold it. Yeah, so it wouldn't become a complete and utter mess. I, I mean, honestly, it's like out of everybody in that group, granted, you know, there were three three soloists, but, I mean, it's just like water. I mean, the rhythm section is just like water running through it, but it almost seems like, and you know that people are listening to each other. How did you learn to How did you learn to lock in if the music was so loud? Did you learn to just just focus on something Billy was doing on the snare? Or the, I mean, how did you learn to to sort of just? Well, I wore uh, wax earplugs. Wax right? ear, yes. Because I was standing so close to Billy, you know, and he had this massive Chinese symbol next to my right ear <laughs> that he hit with the tick end of the stick as loud as possible, right? So I quickly learned, you better cover your ear or you're going to go deaf. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I could hear it. My bass amp was like, you know, eight feet tall. It was one of those ridiculous. I couldn't even, it was so loud, I couldn't even hear the note, really. But, you know, you get used to it. You figure out how to do it. You know? And, uh, yeah, so that was that was the way I choose to play. I'm not sure it was the most appropriate way to play in that group, but for me it was like, okay, just be the anchor. You know, you're the guy in charge of the store here. You know, Because that gives them a lot of freedom, because they can feel confident that if they lose themselves, which they frequently did, right, you could always come back, oh, there's one. <laughs> one. I heard the bass note, and it's on one. Um, basically the gig, you know, hold, hold the thing down, you know. Oh, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it's just confounding. I mean, did, did you, you know, Billy, Billy met John at a, a CT, uh, as a Creed Taylor recording date for the John Anderson tapes, uh, um, and I just know that you probably were were gigging with with uh, with John. Uh, I know he worked with the um, with with a cat from uh, Cream, um, uh, doing lyrics. Uh, he was doing poet, writing a lot of poetry in, in England. But did you guys first cross paths at Ronnie Scott's? Early, uh, late 63, we, were, we started playing together with Brian Auger. We had a, Brian, Brian and I had a trio in London for a while. This is before I was playing at Ronnie Scott's. And uh, eventually we expanded it. We played at a club called the Pigalle, which is a sort of a showtime night, dinner nightclub place in London. How do you spell and, it? How do you spell it? Pigalle. P I G A L L E. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, you know, it's got a stage, you know, like a, with curtains and everything. But all instead of a theater, it's like a tables and chairs for dinner, that kind of place. Sure. So we were the intermission trio between the different shows. They had magicians, they had clowns, you know, dancing girls, you know, the whole. It sounds fantastic. Who was the drummer? The drummer on that gig was an, a guy named Phil uh, Phil Kinora, K I N O R R A. Wow. 
Oh, and this guy Seaman, you said he was like a monster. Like, I mean, he, there were some wild drummers out there, man. Like, they never get. I hope someone's doing some of this digging around because I mean, these English drummers were out of control. Yeah, there were some very good drummers. Uh, I played with what I told you my favorite was Ronnie Stevenson. We played uh, with many of the Americans, including we did a there's a BBC TV show you can see on YouTube. Just type in the name Vic. Victor Feldman. Oh my God! Are you kidding? You were playing with Vic back in 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 England, in London. Yeah, yeah. Well, you gotta see the YouTube man. Just type in. Um, dude, I dude, I mean Victor Feldman on the Steely Dan. I mean, I freak out with that. Like, I, I freak, no, this is. I'm gonna throw that in immediately. That's unreal. The drummer on that was Ronnie Stevenson, and uh, so we had a trio. Yeah, we did did a month at Ronnie's. Yeah. So Auger, you and Auger, and uh, you, you have a trio at this, at this supper. Yes. Yeah, so continue. Yeah, we added baritone sax, a guy named Glenn Hughes, a young saxophone player, and John McLaughlin was the guitar player. So we started playing. And the music was very, you know, sort of, sort of mid-60s mixture of light rock, you know, not out-and-out out jazz, really. We didn't play wasn't really jazz at all. It was more like pop, you know. And John at that time was uh, doing quite a lot of uh, record dates, you know, just show up as the guitar player and do the date. That Absolutely. Time. Studio Shark, yeah. Studio, yeah, that's what he was doing. And we would, uh, we had, actually we played a gig one night at Ronnie's, a Monday night, which was a slow night. Uh, me and John and the baritone sax player with no piano and no drum. So that was an interesting little group. Whoa, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> wow. I mean, th this was this was acoustic? Yes. Yeah, John on electric, right? John yeah, on electric, and, and you were playing upright. Auger was on... I mean, there the were... Uh, Auger was a piano player. Yeah, Brian Auger trio. He had a group called the Trinity. Yes. Brian Auger. So anyway, that's how it started, and then the next time I encountered John, I was in Boston, still going to school. I had a little apartment with an extra room, and he showed up at the jazz workshop with Tony Williams and Larry, uh, the organ player. Yeah, Larry right. Young, life, the emergency. So that was Tony Williams' lifetime. That's, yeah, exactly. And that's where a lot of Mahavishnu came from, that kind of really intense, rhythmically insane kind of groove you know so they were so they were playing there and i uh john was looking for a place to stay so he stayed at my house for a week you know so we you know we have a lot of history together and then i i had been playing a year with buddy rich and this is after i left berkeley before my audition and uh spent about a year on and off with buddy and finished up back in London because I didn't want to live in America at that time. It was Nixon and Agnew and the Vietnam War. And I thought, no, I'm going back to England. Thank you. <laughs> so I went back there and I was kind of reestablishing myself. You know, the whole gig at Ronnie's had changed a lot and they didn't have a house rhythm section anymore. So it was all different, you know. And then I get uh, a telegraph from New York a lot of stories there. Can you? I'm sorry. Can you, you got a telegraph from New York, and and what and what did it? It was from John. John saying he had a, a a record deal with CBS, and he was starting this group. And could I come to New York and be the bass player? <laughs> um, now this was. Um, this was. To I mean, this wasn't like something where, like, when he crashed with you for a week, and he was sort of already, you know, sort of hinting at the idea that he may want to start something, this was completely out of the blue. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because... Well, I didn't really... Yeah. Go ahead. Where I don't know the accurate story, but it goes something like Miles uh, called Clive, Stephen, uh, Clive Davis at CBS and because he just done the album The Silent Way with John. Mm-hmm. Right. And so he called Clive Davis and, and recommended that Clive think about signing John. Right? As far as I know, that was the story of how it happened. And then uh, our manager, Nat Weiss, uh, entertainment 
manager in New York was the guy that signed that signed the deal with CBS for John. They had a three record deal. I think the advance was fifty thousand dollars. And out of that, you know, we had to we had to hire the five the four of us. We had to start rehearsing, pay for the, the rehearsal studios and we were getting a tiny stipend every week to live on. Thankfully, my wife had a job at the time. So you did, but I mean, you immediately moved back to the United States. Immediately, we just packed up and left. That's all, you know, because you know, I mean, I've chronicled, was it was it at Baggies? Is that where you were playing, rehearsing at? A place called Baggies? It might have been, yeah. It might have been. It was in Soho. It was in Soho, yeah. because, I mean, I mean, Goodman, when I interviewed Jerry, he said that I mean, he literally quit. The flock had broken up, and he was living on a, in a barn in the middle of winter in Wisconsin, and out of the blue, he gets this call from a guy with a really interesting accent, and it's John basically saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about putting this band together. You know, you want to be part of it. And <laughs> next thing you know, he comes, and it's just amazing to see – how all the the people came together. Um, um, I do. I want I'm, this. This might. I, I want to play this for you. I think this is going to bring a smile to your faces and another name that voice for Rick Laird. And then we'll come back and break it down. All right. Um, I mean, things were going very well. I'd already uh, Mavish the Rockets was running. I mean, we were enjoying just phenomenal success. Um, I mean, not just musically, but commercially, too. This was the biggest surprise of all. And one day, uh, my guruji, he, he, he said, so, you know, uh, Mahavishnu, uh, you know, the, the disciples need to, need to eat a good meal and cheap. So why don't you open a restaurant? <laughs> and so so that, that's what I did. And, uh, oh, and it was in Queens. And, um, and, and that's why I learned to cook uh, Indian food, <laughs> you know, uh, not very well, but I got better. I, I, I cannot wait to have, to, I, wait, hold on for a second. Did you? I still have to do it. Yeah, um, go ahead. The thing, but the thing is, it was, it was, you know, I had to make basically a good meal for $1.50. And uh, even in you know, 1972, uh, that, that's a tough call. And basically, so I was I was just losing money every month. <clears throat> but it was it was what I, what I considered part of my divine duties, for want of another word. And and I was very happy to, that 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 you know it, it helped people who didn't have much money to come and eat very cheap and good food, vegetarian. In any event, uh, I kept it going for about t- two years, and uh, but it got it got heavy for me in the sense that. <laughs> I really couldn't take care of it. I was touring all the time. And, and so I had to allocate, um, you know, responsibility to different people. And, uh, and in the end, <clears throat> uh, after a couple of years, I, I, I said to my guru, I said, Guruji, I, I'm, I'm really having a problem <laughs> with this, you know. <clears throat> and he said, well, it's okay. He said, you know, you've, you've learned enough, I think, from that experience and I and so I gave it away actually the, the restaurant <laughs> I gave it to a couple of the girl disciples lady disciples of the of the street all right Mr. Laird you know who that is that's like John it is John uh yeah. and I'm curious if you um uh ate at that Indian restaurant uh I don't I never did no because the Jerry, when Jerry said he, when he first came out there, there was this, um, uh, in Queens, uh, he, he used to sit on the floor and play violin. John would play acoustic guitar. Um, when you, when you got, um, back to New York, um, is it true that Charlie Hayden was the original bass player? I don't know. I mean, it may have been. I never heard much about it. Well, he wasn't there very long, but I mean, I mean, if you how in your mind, if it, like granted, you it was <clears throat> I don't even know how to describe it was orchestra music. But if you could, how did what did John's concept? How did he want to be different 
than 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 Tony Williams' lifetime. Uh, you said it really, and I think you made a very pressing point in that Mahavishnu Orchestra was an offspring of 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 lifetime. But how was it? How did it? How did it? Was it just different because you had uh, essentially you were incorporating like maybe um, uh, a typical symphonic instrument like the violin, but using it in electric setting? What what was what? How did how was it different than lifetime? Well, it was first of all uh, Jan. Uh, quickly after we started, got a mini Moog, right? He was one of the very early adopters right. around the same time as Joe Zalanul and Chick. But I think Jan was even earlier because uh, I think uh, he got a he was given the mini Moog as a demo to to you know to help develop it, and he immediately converted it into this incredible solo instrument. You know, he was playing solos right up there with John. You know. Exactly. That's a very good point. He was the yeah. first. He, you think he was the first one? That's amazing. He was the first one Shush. to play at that level. You know, because he was such a, such a great musician. I mean, he was so uh, skilled in the language of jazz. You know, his harmonic melodic stuff was. I think he was, for me, the best musician in the band by far. You know, in in that sense. You know, in that sense. In his, the way he developed harmony and melodic patterns, he was amazing. But, you know, he was a very well-schooled musician. He went to the Prague Conservatory when he was a child, you know, so he had... Uh, we all had such different backgrounds. You know, Jerry was a rocker, pretty much. I mean, he had... His parents were both violinists in the, in the Chicago Orchestra, you know. So he had a lot of violin background, but more in the classical and rock genre. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. He wasn't a jazzer by any means. You know. Different language altogether. Right, and I mean, in some ways, the violin, when bebop came in, kind of disappeared from from jazz to begin with. I mean, it, it was just not really part of the vernacular for a long time. Um, right, right. But anyway, yeah, so he, he and then um, Billy... Um, Billy Billy was a jazzer. Billy Billy was playing jazz, um, but more like definitely not. Nobody was coming out of the academy. I don't think. No, but he, you know, I think he got his groove in, in a group called Dream. Absolutely. You no, know, that's where he kind of found his thing, you know. And so he took that into Mahavishnu. But he was. Uh, I mean, I was listening to him the other day. I was someone was playing uh, one of our pieces on YouTube. And I was just amazed at Calvin back. His energy at that time was amazing. He's playing, you know, two bass drums, you know, ambidextrous with all four limbs, you know. It's, it, it is beyond, it, there are, are, and so many beautiful pro shot, closed circuit television recordings, and it's like, I mean, it's just like waterfall. I, I don't even know, it's just, it's just colors flying everywhere. I, I can't, I don't, can't even understand it, you know, it's unreal. Yeah. Did you did you find in those early like John was talking in that clip about Sri Chimnoy? I just find that to be I mean it's antithetical today in today's pop music. Not that you guys are playing pop music, but in, there was a record industry, and you know here's John McLaughlin, who was really not a super. He wasn't a star at that point, like you said. He was he, well, he was on Kind of Blue, and Miles gave him Miles hooked him up with Clive Davis, but. Um, you know, the idea that he would do something spiritual like cook Indian food all, when he was off the road with Mahavishnu, but you guys were having amazingly... Commer when, when did it kind of hit you personally that this was something new? That the, I guess going back to the idea of musical vocabulary, that this whatever that you guys were fusing together was new uh, and invigorating to the audiences... Um, when, when, was there was there a moment early on when you recognized that? Well, you know, we met a lot of resistance in the early days. You know, we played uh, sort of cheapo college campus gigs just to get, you know, just to, to get familiar with uh, how we were going to put a show together, you know. Because we never discussed those things. You know, we just went on stage and we'd have a menu of things to play. 
but we hadn't really developed things like, oh, halfway through we'll have Billy and John play together. <laughs> right. Then maybe, right. That would just take a life of its own. Right, and then Jerry and, and uh, Jan could play together, right, and we'd all leave the stage. You know, we hadn't figured out those things yet. And we so we were playing opening gigs, sometimes to sort of semi-name rock and pop groups, right? So we'd be the opening show. We, we often got booed. You know, I remember Stony Brook out in Long Island. We went to one university to play. And they didn't like us at all. Well, you know what? That's where I was born. <laughs> SUNY Stony Brook, man. I'm not happy that my people didn't support you. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it, it, they didn't like it at all because, well, and it, you know, well, no, because Johnny, Johnny told me, he's like, you guys used to open for Black Sabbath, you know, like, right. he, like heavy rock, like heavy yeah. metal. And yeah. it's like, and then there's all those epic pictures of you guys, you know, basically sporting like, you know, Kansas State t-shirts and, you know, you know, you guys doing laundry on this, you know, people we throw in. The, but would you say that the college kids really got off on you guys? Was that where your momentum started? Oh, yeah, they really did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those were those were our probably best gigs in terms of support. You know. Yeah, you know, they loved it. Yeah. And you know the the you know, the thing about it, you know, the few records that we've made, you know, and the few YouTubes that are available. But you know, we were so busy, we were on the road so much, and uh, you know, just schlepping one town to the other, one city to the other, and really no time for practicing or rehearsing or writing new music. None of there was just no time for that. So the gig was really all that, that we had, you know, the, the gig was, that was it, that's what you did every day. But the irony is that some of the very, very best performances we ever did were often done in some no-name town in the middle of Ohio on a Thursday night. <laughs> I'm just laughing because that is a common thread for all my favorite bands is that their best shows yeah, you, came at the most off the beaten path places. Yeah, you just have a night like the whole thing just takes off and you're kind of having an out of body experience. It's like, I'm not even here. This is just <laughs> happening. <laughs> it's the greatest feeling in the world, man. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, you know, in that vi audio clip that Mike Knox said, he said, I was accepted at Minton's by Turrentine and Yousef and those guys because I wasn't American. Right. Can you, for the layperson, I'm 42, but also for my daughters and for people that are going to listen to this in 50 years, what, is he, what did he mean? What does he mean by that? Um... Well, I, I've had similar experiences, you know, because, uh, I mean, I never get to talk about race at all, you know, in general. I mean, I, all the people I admired in jazz were black Americans. Sure. That was their music, after all, you know. Uh, yeah, I had a gig like that once with uh, in Boston when I was there. I got to play to this club called Lenny's out on the Turnpike. It was about an hour out of town, maybe. And uh, I got a gig. Pretty strong word, but he, you know, he was suspicious of white jazz players, you know what I mean? But anyway, I got on the bandstand, and the drummer was Alan Dawson and uh, Horace Parlin on piano. And he put me through the ringer, man, for the first hour. It was like he played the fastest tunes you could possibly imagine, right? And once he figured out, hey, this guy's killing it, you know, that was the end of it. No more, you know, his attitude completely changed, you know. But he didn't know I wasn't uh, American, you know. He did, he, 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 so I'm sorry, the, the, my Skype dropped. Did, did you say Booker Irvin? Who was, who was the cat? No, it was Sonny Stitt, the album. Oh, man. Also, Stitt, Parlin. So, but I mean, there was a general distrust of American or white-skinned people, 
um, within this, because I mean, even Liebman said it, I mean, quite frankly, even though um, you were very particular about your, your work, you know, the, the albums that you were on studio-wise and things like that after Mahavishnu, um, I mean, basically jazz was, Liebman said it, he goes, I mean, up through the 70s, it was basically a black subculture, yeah. um, but if you were white and you could play, then you were cool. But, you know, knock, make, making that, when Mike came over here, just making a statement like that was like, really? I mean, I, I understand that there's this, uh, um, I just don't even know. I mean, what, what, in your mind, like, Rick, honestly, like, like you know, if, if me and you sat on the street corner somewhere in New York and, was, and asked 15 different people what their definition or concept of jazz is, you'd get 15 different answers. And it's a, it's ridiculous. It's it, it, to me, it is. I mean, it is emotional, spiritual, burning music. Um, that's jazz. I mean, and, and then you might say that it's attached to, at one time, standards, Great American Songbook. But it spews. It's 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 fusing those standard tunes with the spiritual quality of music, like you say when you lock in, and you. It's almost like you're not there. Right. That's that's how I look at it. But I mean, what would you say? I mean, was terminology really even being used back then? Like, I mean, like, I mean, there was no word for funk in the lexicon. Not until like the headhunters came along did people say, "Oh, that's funk music." People say, right. "Let's play a funky blues," you know, like in the late '60s. I mean, do you feel like labels have really hurt music? Uh, yeah, I think they have, and it was interesting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a show on PBS, uh, the Miles Davis story. Sure. Uh, wonderfully done, and uh, black and white mostly, I think. And then I, I compared that to the movie, you know, with Don Cheadle. Sure. Which I didn't like at all. I thought, why, why do you want to remember Miles like that? Why just don't? Why just not listen to his music? Right? Forget about his personality. Listen to his music. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the essence of who he is. Don't worry about all that gangster stuff. Forget about it. Right? Mm -hmm. Because in the end, that's all you got. That's the legacy they leave. They don't leave all their personality defects. They leave this amazing legacy of beautiful music, you know, that will live forever, you know. So that's the thing, you know, value the music and forget about the personalities, you know. What would be your, um, you know, uh, Sonny Stitt was, you know, that, that guy would just be blowing and blowing and blowing and blowing and, um, you know, after an hour you'd, you could keep up and he'd say, oh, you can play this motherfucker. You can stand, you know, you're cool. And, uh, exactly, yeah. you know, and, 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 but, but I mean, what was, but, but what was, how would you describe, I mean, a lot of people who like, even in later years who would go to more like peers of mine who went to like the heart school of music and Jackie McLean was their teacher. Right. A lot of times, like he just turn around and say things like, give me all you got, man. You know, like, like it was more like about urgency and energy more than a label as it related to the music. How would you describe the way those guys talked about this music, this music that we know as some people would say melodic improvisation, whatever it is, it's just like, I think to me, it's like, I, I love all music, but you'll hear a lot of younger people say, oh, I don't like jazz because whatever they've heard is like Kenny G or some kind of smooth thing. It's not what you came up on. So how would you, what would be your definition of, of jazz? Well, I mean, I guess it's important to know the history of jazz, you know. Uh, I mean, you don't have to know it in excruciating detail, but some... <laughs> You know, have some sense of how it all began. Right. That it is black American music. It didn't start with white people, right? Definitely. But as it evolved, it eventually and increased.
increasingly included white people, you know, because you had big bands with mixed, you know, races in it. And then, but it was it was late to develop. I mean, like Frank Sinatra's orchestra, he was one of the first ones to have, you know, mixed uh, races in his band, and he took a lot of heat for that. You know, I mean, he would. They would arrive at hotels in the south, and they'd say, y- y- "You can all stay here, but not the black people." And Frank wouldn't stay there. Absolutely, dude. I, Tootie Heath told me that uh, his band, mixed race bands, would show up at a club, and some of them didn't have their uh, cabaret or the, or the black. They're like, "Well, it was something about a cabaret license, maybe." But they said, "You know, the uh, you can play, but but you're gonna, we're going to call in." Uh, Union musicians that are white, and Frank's like, "No, we'll just pack up and go." Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So then there was this. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break your 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 theme there. Your. your... Yeah. So you have to understand how it evolved like that, and you know, it, it, it's certainly better than it ever was. It's not not even close to being, you know, perfect, but it's it's definitely better. You know. Uh, no, I mean it's just. It, it's you know, well, it depends, I suppose. Um, I suppose, you know, if if you were George Carlin, which I'm not, but he would probably say, there's some really dumb people in America. <laughs> George Carlin used to open up for possibly, I yeah, know we, I know he used to open up for Miles Davis, and, and I mean, Richard Pryor used to do that. I'm not sure if they ever opened for Bob Vishnu or not, but... Those guys are, but so I mean, you just think that there's an that people don't know the history of it. Um, well, it's first of all, it's not promoted in in the same way as pop music, not even close. So, your average person out in the flyover areas of America mm-hmm. never gets to hear it. Never gets to hear it. They hear the same old, same old, you know, country and western or whatever the current pop du jour is. But they don't get any exposure. Same with classical music. They never get to hear beautiful classical music, you know. So, because there's not that much money in it, you know, there's, there's no, there's no uh, jazz billionaires, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, when you, I mean, I noticed, I, I, I regret it now because we had this massive record depot in Tucson where I live and um, it, some they closed the city closed it down, <clears throat> and some Brazilian guy came in and bought all the records in the store. And and the one record I forgot to to pick up was, um, yourself your album is a leader with Joe Henderson, and, oh, yeah. and I'm like, when I hear Joe Henderson play, um, or uh, Sonny Rollins or Bobby Hutcherson or the late great McCoy Tyner. I mean, I just hear urgency. I hear like a, 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 an urgent cry for 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 something. I, you know, uh, I mean, journalists called a lot of tr- Coltrane's music hate music uh, because when you don't understand something, you fear it, and that turns to hate. I guess I don't understand why people would call it that, but it was just more about like love and. And yeah, like you talked about with Miles, it was more about like, I mean, he didn't play a lot of notes. It was more about his vibe, but people just are so intoxicated with sort of all the superfluous stuff, the the gangster lifestyle or the way he treated people or whatever it was. Um, yeah, it's not that important, you know, just listen to uh, right. Kind of Blue every day. <laughs> I mean, if you look at it, it's like a couple of Brubeck records. Um, girl from Ipanema and kind of blue, and maybe a head the Headhunters album with Herbie, which is kind of more. I mean, those were like the highest selling jazz albums of all time. I mean, you know, that was that was that came out when I started playing in 1959. I was, you know. And that changed everything, that album. In your mind, it, did it change everything? Because you, in in your subconscious, there was no way you knew this unless it was on the liner notes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when did you realize that it was a completely unscripted studio performance? Like, it was just, Miles came in with nothing really prepared. I mean, isn't that the magic of that album? It's all improvisation, all spontaneous? 
Well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's such a combination of uh, forces. You know, there's all the 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 selection of musicians, including Bill Evans on piano, as well as Wynton Kelly, and of course Paul Chambers. Uh, but Train was also beginning to break out into his thing at that point. He was really starting to become who we recognized him to be, right? in that period so that that album was like wow listen to train boy he's just taken off so yeah and the precedent they set with you know just sketchy little pieces that turned into these beautiful things you know in some ways Mahavishnu was kind of like that I mean when he showed up with the charts when we were rehearsing sometimes it was just a half a page of music manuscript with, with like eight bars of something that looked like a bass part. <laughs> right, it was just a sketch, just a sketch, just a sketch. Just an idea. Yeah, like, I love it. This is something to start with, you know. And that's how it was, you know. And so I would, you know, for example, one of my favorite pieces is A Dance of Maya, right? I, I always liked that piece. Mm -hmm. Because the time signature was so weird, right? I counted it as six and a half, four, right? Because I used to love watching the audience, you know, standing up and clapping, and they could never get it right. <laughs> it wasn't four, four. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, I'd still find a way to make it danceable, but they, they couldn't clap on the right beat. Right, exactly. Yeah. I'm looking at it, I mean, they're, they're just not getting this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, but this is, just, I, I, I really would love to do set two with you at, at some point. I, it, I have some more questions for you, but um, the one final thing I wanted to ask you is you look at Chano Pozo. Some people would say that was the first fusion music when he came from uh, Disney, right? With Dizzy, uh, when, when, when Chano came from Cuba um, and Afro-Cuban jazz came into play, a lot of people don't realize that Girl from Ipanema, Stan Getz, obviously, because he was, well, white, uh, you know, but also he could play his horn, he's just blown over the top, but the rhythm came from Jao Donato. Um, and then, from Brazil, and then, you know, like people like Ayerto, um you know, he told Ayrton when I interviewed him, he he came to the States um, around 69, spoke no English, and he'd go to these clubs where they spoke Spanish. I don't even know if they played Bossa music, but they were, you know, that he could at least communicate, and they'd say, no, 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 you you, you could take your shaker and, and sit in the corner there and, you know, and, and shake it, but you can't be on stage with us. So, you know, who found him was... Roy McCurdy and Walter Booker and Miles and they love the refrigerator tubes and all the you know kashikis and the in the you know all, all sorts of African percussion the point is the question for Rick Laird is what has been immigrants contributions to this American roots music of jazz or even blues what, what, what would you what would be your take on them? what 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 have they what did they add to it? Well, I'm trying to think of uh, the immigrants. I mean, so many people came when I came, like John Hammer came. Uh, we were in school together. We played a lot of gigs in Boston. George Moraes came. Miroslav Vitus. These are all the guys that I've, I mean, no, because I mean, you and, you and Jan were doing gigs on that boat that went around the harbor, right? Uh, no, I didn't. I think that was Gene Perla. Yeah, Perla was on those. You know, that's. I should be very clear about this. I I, I am really talking about uh, Jan, Alan Broadbent, Jao. Jo, that pocket. Your your generation. What did your generation bring to bring to this roots music of America? Hard to say. I mean, because we all came from such different cultures. Like I told you, Jan grew up in Prague while it was still communist, right? Mm -hmm. And he was 
very supported by his parents, I think, who were jazz lovers. They listened to Voice of America, you know. Oh, big time. Yeah, definitely. He told me that in our interview, yeah. Uh, so his exposure to music was very mid-European, you know, the Czechoslovakian, that wonderful kind of classical sensibility they have, you know, the way they put harmony together, it's, you know, uh, different than American music, you know. Traditionally, a lot of it goes back hundreds of years, that stuff, you know. So Jan, oh, I, I always heard his piano playing as, wow, he's, he does different stuff. He's not playing American jazz. This is, yeah, it is American jazz, and, and, it, and it, yeah, it conforms to that genre. But he's bringing a different color to it. He has his own harmonic thing, right? Right. And it's... In some ways, Mike Knock too. You yeah, know, definitely, Knock. definitely. He didn't. He didn't. Didn't sound like anybody. He didn't sound like Bill Evans. You know, he sounded like Mike Knock. You know. So I think we all brought our own thing, and that because I brought that fabulous uh, two years of experience from Ronnie Scotts, where I played with you know probably twenty different American masters. I brought that experience with me. You know. That was a unique experience, for sure. Yeah. Did you have the same kind of mid-European, I don't know, the way you just talked about, Jan, the mid-European flavor, uh, would you be able to identify the flavor you, you, you sort of injected into what would be um, American jazz? Well, I, I can't say I have anything in particular like that. Uh but I'm going to, I'll send you some music that I write. I, you know, I'm a composer. Oh, please, yeah, that'd be great. I don't do it for any reason. I'm not selling it. I don't publish it. I don't put it on Facebook. I just, I send it to a few friends. I send it to Alan Broadbent. I send it to Jan. I have a few friends in Australia that I send it to. You know, I send it to Mike Knock. You know, these are all my, I mean, dude, these are all my people, man. I mean, rest in peace. He's not around anymore. Bryce Rohde. Oh, yeah. the, I mean, I, I'm writing a book. I don't even, I guess maybe, I, I think it's a hard ne needle to thread, but I could use your help trying to, I am. I do want to put a, a book, I'm trying to put a volume of the cats together about the immigrants' contributions to American jazz uh, it, 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 from like, you know, the 60s and 70s. I mean, there was just, there was this, I mean, even going, like, there's just, there was, um, there's something there. It di they didn't fundamentally change the music, but the vibe changed, and I mean, and the language did change a little bit. It was just it's it's prescient in this time, and I just also find it amazing how you know people could come from completely different cultures in South America or Cuba or you know. Yeah, well, I, I think I think the strength of it really is that. Uh, the in the essence of it is overrides race. Right. You know, it's it's a it's a particular sensibility. It's a particular perspective on the world. You know, it's like it doesn't matter what color you right, are. Right, right, right. You're you're doing with a, a musical instrument or a, a painting on a canvas or dancing. It doesn't matter. It's like the essence of it is bigger than race. Right? It, it's about it's about spirit, really. And it, yeah, inclusivity and spirit. I love it. Yeah, that's that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. Um, Rick, I you mean, know, yeah, go ahead. We're all we're all the, we're all the same. We're all just human beings on this planet. Look at what we're going through now. We have it. We have a virus that doesn't give a rat's ass who you are. It's coming for you, right? So and you can have all the travel bands you want on non. I mean, it's just like. It, it's oh, it's just going to affect people, just people. It doesn't matter. It's not it's, seg it's not segregated. It's not discriminating against one particular type of people. It's all people. All of us. We're all in this together. This is a planetary emergency that doesn't need any politics. It needs smart scientific facts. Yeah. Well, that's the farthest thing from where we're at right now. So I don't know. Um, yeah, it's it's worrisome, and I think the 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 the, cog the cognitive dissidence at the political level is something that I've never 
witnessed in my 42 years and I've not been on this planet a long time, but it, it, it's one of these things where we're presented now with a problem that cannot be tweeted away and a little bit of that essence of, of jazz community and spirit and, and obviously fusing that with the scientific knowledge would go a long way towards um, limiting the potential damage of this uh, virus. So it's all we can, that's all we can hope for. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like the rules are pretty simple. Stay home as much as possible if you can. Avoid, avoid a lot of face-to-face and avoid crowds completely. You know, wash your hands, wash, don't touch your face. Well, would have, would, what a fascinating um, optics it would be to have seen Mahavishnu Orchestra playing to an empty arena. <laughs> I mean, they would have canceled the concert, but, you know, it just would have, I mean, it's, yeah, it's profound. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it definitely in this country, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So, um, anyway, Rick, I, um, I had a ball, man. I, I'd love to do part two with you uh, in the near future. No problem. And uh, I'll get this up online later and uh, have a blessed oh, day. Yes. Yeah. Uh, where can I find your uh, email so I can send you some music? To can I? I'll, so I'll just send you a message through Facebook Messenger. Does that, does that oh. work? All right. Yeah. And okay. uh, yeah, much love to you, man. It was great to hear you, dude. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for going there with me. It was fun. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. All right, man. Be cool. Bye bye. Later. Uh, we'll be back at, uh, sometime real soon. Until then, this is the Jake Feinberg Show. Peace. <laughs> okay. <laughs>